Okay, I think it's 12.20. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, it's uh, another HDF clinic. Uh, it's just one of these months where there are five Tuesdays and that means I get the privilege of uh, being here and uh, talking about something. And um, I have uh, prepared uh, something about a a little project that I did uh, over the holidays. I'm one of those sad individuals that uh, does HDF things over the holidays. But uh, before I go there, uh, I wanted to ask for those of you who were able to join, uh, if there are any questions uh, about HDF5, about anything uh, you would like to know. No? Okay then I'll, I'll jump right in and feel free to interrupt me um, if there are any questions along the way. So this is something um, that I've been thinking about it uh, for a while and it starts here with our, if you go to our documentation uh, on uh, docs.hdfgroup.org, HDF5, let's say the develop uh, branch, we have all kinds of documentation posted, including the file format specification. And if you go there, um, you will find there are versions of it. So the, the specification has evolved over time. And for argument's sake, let's open the latest and greatest version here. I'll make it not much bigger because we are not going to spend much time here. Um, but it's grown if you just look at it historically, version 1, 1 1.1, 2, 3. Um, it's grown and it's gotten bigger and bigger and that's fine. Um, however, I was always bothered a little bit by, um, uh, there have certainly been uh, many efforts in the community uh, to write uh, tools or libraries or modules um, that would go directly uh, to this file format specification, bypassing the HDF5 library altogether. And there, is, there are many good reasons to do that. Uh, but then uh, uh, my apologies, or I, I have some sympathy with people who have done this. Uh, we are aware of efforts in Python and JavaScript in Java. Um, uh, they must have had a hard time. I mean, it is true that many of these, uh, call them independent implementations, um, are incomplete typically, so they don't cover the full uh, specification. And that's okay. Uh, but even at that, I think as far as the specification, it's written, it's obviously written in more, uh, most of it English, uh, not in a formal specification language, and that has pros and cons. But I always felt that I, I was not happy with the quality of the documentation and the ease with which uh, independent uh, developers uh, sort of could use it. And, and so there was a lot uh, left uh, to imagination, to putting undocumented things together. And uh, so I, I, I just, I'm not happy with it. So in that always, got me thinking, I thought, well, uh, as for other, I mean, HDF5, the format specification is certainly a little more advanced than some other binary formats. And that got me thinking, well, if I wanted to create, um, let's say a code generator for a serializer, the serializer, how would I go about doing that? And um, the, 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 that's in a way well understood. And if you are old fashioned, um, you can think about something like common Lisp, where uh, it's not so important that it's common Lisp, but it should be a, a language that has very strong uh, metadata, uh, meta programming capabilities. And Lisp is certainly uh, a good example of that. And then if you look at a book uh, such as uh, Practical Common Lisp, which is a very nice uh, book, um, in chapter 24 and a few of the following chapters, Peter Seibel, for example, uh, talks about the problem of passing binary files in general, and then he specifically deals with MP3 files, and the MP3 file format specification is, is not that complicated uh, compared to HDF5, 
But then if you take that further, you could think about like uh, if you wanted to parse object files like in ELF or in the old days in COF format, but nowadays in ELF 32, ELF 64 and uh, formats like that. Um, the problem uh, when you try, and, and I think Peter Seibel does a very good job explaining that and why you need these strong uh, metadata programming capabilities is that um, as you pass these more complex binary formats, th there is information that you do not know at compile time. You discover certain things along the way based, of, uh, based on which you can then later generate new code to pass what's about to come. So it's a little bit of an incremental process. And um, again, that this is something that's been solved. And so in the back of my mind, I had sort of, um, uh, since I also like Lisp, so Lisp is a, is a, is a nice thing to, do, uh, to deal with. Um, I had sort of befriended myself with the idea, well, at the end of the day, I will have to sit down and just uh, write uh, something similar that Peter did here for MP3 and just do it for HDF5 with all the bells and whistles, the uh, metaprogramming capabilities and so forth. But then um, before I went down that path, um, I uh, played actually with something um, in addition to Lisp. I also like Emacs as an editor. Okay, there, there's Elips in the background, but that's not what I'm talking about here. Um, if you ask yourself, well, what kind of binary editors or viewers are out there uh, that you can use to inspect uh, an HDF5 file, let's say in binary form, then um, there is a there is a well understood mode in in Emacs. So, for example, it's called Hexel. So in Emacs, I can say Hexel find file, and then I have a few sample files here in in this directory. I can open that, and that gives me something. And um, that's cool. If you squint um, on the on the right hand side in this column. Um, you, if you are familiar with the HDF specification, um, you will pick up certain column tokens or keywords, such as at the beginning of the file, the HDF5 file signature, um, then in later versions of the file format, uh, object headers uh, begin with this magic four byte uh, uh, sequence OHDR. Um, then in this case, it so happens that uh, the root group is decorated with an attribute that happens to be called ATTR1, and the value is a fixed size, hello world, and then there's a second attribute. And that's all cool, but it has its limits. And um, sort of, I, I started actually by thinking about, well, it would help already since I know something about, if you look at the center column, if I could add some syntax highlighting uh, to that in, in Emacs parlance that would be called font locking, um, that wouldn't be too bad. So I could try to at least highlight um, regions here uh, in certain colors, whether they are object header messages or uh, global heaps or local heaps or, um, and that, uh, that would be fine, but it would get me only so far and wouldn't really help with, um, if I then wanted to go out and let's say not only read, but also create or modify uh, existing HDF files. I, here in Hexel mode, I can, I can actually edit individual bytes if I want to, uh, but then again, without context and on a byte by byte, byte by byte basis, that's rather tedious. But in my searching around just uh, uh, working with font locking, uh, changing the font locking. In Emacs, I stumbled across this thing that I had never seen before uh, called GNU Poke. And um, it turns out that uh, uh, this is a rather modest description here to say that uh, GNU Poke is a interactive editor uh, for binary data. That's a little bit like saying, oh, um, HDF5 is a file format, that's a little bit of an understatement and <laughs> doesn't really 
sort of give you a good understanding of the full depth and breadth, but that's okay. So I stumbled across this thing and I started looking at it. And uh, the beauty of it is that it is actually much, much more uh, than just an interactive editor for uh, binary data. It is actually a language called poke <laughs> uh, and, and you can actually program uh, in this language poke and I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment to the point that you can actually build tools um, for inspecting, manipulating, parsing uh, uh, binary objects. And so um, I just opened here uh, that there is a very nice uh, manual uh, that comes with poke and it's, it's very recent. So this is under active development. And um, so uh, if I, I'll just scroll quickly here through the table of contents. Um, uh, by the way, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll show you in a moment, there is a very nice YouTube video, I think from last year or the year before, um, where the author uh, actually uh, gives sort of a, a whirlwind tour of what new poke can do and uh, very well done. And uh, the guy is very sharp. And uh, so, yeah, he walks you through um, uh, things, how you structure data in POKE. Uh, so you can, the, the main vehicle of structuring things in POKE um, is through these so-called pickles. And by pickles, I don't mean Python pickles, um, but he calls um, definitions of types and structures. You can also declare variables and define methods and so forth. Uh, but uh, storing these structured definitions or these structured definitions is what, uh, what in poke parlance are called pickles. So, so they are here. And then there's a lot about configuration, but then also how you then, once you've produced a bunch of these definitions, how you can uh, build tools with that. Some of you might be familiar with H5 debug, for example, or uh, that there are a few other command line utilities that um, uh, are available uh, uh, with, with the HDF5 library that you can use to inspect HDF5 files. However, when it comes to maintainability and so forth, as I hope uh, you will see in a moment, I think this is a much, much easier approach because it is more like uh, yeah, maintaining Python scripts or something that resembles a scripting language uh, rather than uh, yeah, having to maintain a pretty uh, extensive C code base where you have to implement pretty much everything from first principles. So, so Poke is, is a much, much more modern uh, and dynamic uh, language. And uh, yeah, and there, there is a lot more than there are examples in here. Of course, there is a fantastic uh, Emacs interface that comes with Poke, but I'm not gonna talk about that here and today. And then here uh, in, in chapter 20, um, uh, they describe in detail what this Poke uh, language looks like and what you can do with it. And so that's maybe good enough. And, and then so what, what finally got me is that if you look in the source tree uh, for poke, um, they have a subdirectory, I, I believe it's called pickles, uh, where they provide example pickles uh, for uh, different binary formats and elf, uh, the, the object format is one. I, I, I'm sure there's also an MP3 examples and there are a few others. HDF5 unfortunately wasn't among them, but hey, I think we can help that. <laughs> and um, okay, so what I did was basically for myself to explore, okay, going back to this specification here, um, looking at these descriptions and so forth, okay, I have to somehow translate that into poke and then just do it. And uh, so that's where this GitHub uh, repo comes in. It's publicly accessible, HDF group, HDF5 poker. And um, what I put in here are, are sort of the main resources. By the way, here's that YouTube video that I, if you wanna just get an understanding of 
uh, where this is coming from and where this is going, I highly recommend you watch that. And I started uh, collecting, and I'll give you a brief demo in a moment, I started collecting uh, uh, some of these pickles. And uh, so I have a few at the moment, um, I can sort of easily uh, pass a super block object headers and some of the object header messages. And that's what I'm gonna show you right now. Um, so to see this in action, maybe uh, I'm gonna switch over to my terminal here. Uh, so I have a bunch of HDF5 files here in my directory. And um, yeah, I'm just gonna, so you can launch poke. And so I'm not uh, the, the latest version or the, uh, I, I forgot if there was an official 3.0 release. I think 3.0 uh, poke is under development. So this is the latest release version, which was uh, 2.4. And uh, so it has this uh, interface. Again, there's an Emacs interface. I'm not gonna uh, get into that today. And then you can uh, load an HDF5 file. So if we take, for example, uh, the, the file that I showed you previously, that strings.hdf5 file. So I can say strings.h5. And so now um, poke, uh, creates an internal handle. It has this concept of so-called IO spaces. Um, uh, and and uh, you can have, like you can have multiple files open, you can have multiple IO spaces. And these IO spaces can be binary files. They can be memory buffer. They can also be the, um, the, the working set or the memory uh, of running processes if you want, but, but again, uh, consult the um, uh, poke uh, manual for that. So this is my uh, strings.h5 file. And what I can uh, do now is I can basically poke into that file, use some of my uh, uh, pickers that I'll show you in a moment uh, to sort of uh, 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 introspect certain aspects of this HDF5 file. So for example, I defined uh, a type, a poke type that I call HDF5 file. And then this notion here of at a certain offset, that's for example, uh, we, we won't have time for that today, but I have some files, for example, that have a user block um, where you wouldn't be uh, looking for that uh, uh, super block at the offset zero, but at a power of two greater than 512 bytes. So. If, for example, I had a super block of one kilobyte, um, I would say something like this. I would say, well, go search for that super block at this offset, but in this case, there is none. So I, I just defined a variable called file. And of course, I can look at this and there is already something interesting happening here. So first of all, uh, you see already this structured or this nested structured nature. Uh, we have the uh, the, the HDF5 signature at the beginning of the file, then if you are familiar a little bit, or if we went back to the specification, we know that the super block version is the next thing that we expect. And in this case, it's version three, but it could be zero, one, or two. Um, and uh, then if it's a uh, version three, um, we actually expect to learn something about the size of offsets in a file, the size of sizes in a file. So in this case, it's both eight. We have file consistency flags. We have sort of a base uh, by which we may have to offset some of the addresses in the file. In this case, there is no super block extension. So this would be the zero X, F, 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 all Fs. Um, then we have the end of file address, um, the uh, address of the root groups object header, and then the checksum. So in uh, 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 file format specification versions, I think two and three, uh, all metadata is signed. So this would be the checksum, the, uh, I think the CRC32 uh, checksum of the super block. And that's cool. Um, so now we can uh, take that a little further. We can say, well, tell me something about this root. Um, so as I said in poke, we have this variable here called file 
uh, of type HDF5 file. And then in, in the poke language, you can define, uh, you can define uh, methods. And here I have a method defined called get root um, that uh, lets me sort of retrieve a representation of the root group. And now again, I can look at root. Um, and um, again, if you are familiar with the specification a little bit, or you should actually, I mean, of course, when I wrote these, and I'll show you these pickles in a moment, when I wrote these, I was sort of looking at this and basically writing down struct definitions. I was sort of playing the, the, meta, the, the meta code generator <laughs> uh, to generate the code for this, but, but it's actually not that difficult. Um, so you see that there's going to be an object header message, and um, there, there are fundamentally two versions in the different specifications. So this happens to be a version two, and there is a certain uh, magic OHDR, I told you already, so that would be an ASCII OHDR. Then there is a version number, there are flags. In this case, uh, since it's uh, a newer version of the specification, we are actually tracking timestamps, meaning for the root group, in this case, the access time, modification time, change time, birth time, yada, yada, yada. Um, and then for the actual messages, that's sort of what tells um, uh, uh, any kind of parser that what this is, is that this is a group, obviously, uh, what kind of attributes it might have, the reference count, things like that. And then as already with the super block, there's gonna be a checksum in the end. So now as somebody interested in uh, uh, diving deeper, I would, for example, like to know, well, how many header messages are there actually, and what are they? So again, um, I can now say, for example, root, uh, and here, uh, this, this would be member version two, I can say get messages. And that gives me, so this tells me that there are one, two, three, four, five header messages in this case. And then if you are familiar a little bit um, with uh, uh, sort of uh, the message types, and actually I can quickly show you, or I can actually show you <clears throat> in the, uh, uh, I created uh, one pickle here where I just define these different message types. So I'll make it a little bigger. Um, and then we can sort of look at uh, what, what the messages are that we are actually seeing here. So the first one is message type two, I believe that's a link info. Yeah, so that's a link info. Uh, then the next one would be 10, uh, that is a group info, obviously, because we are dealing with a group here. Uh, then we have 21, uh, which is an attribute info. Remember this, um, uh, uh, this was a group um, that, uh, had uh, an attribute attached to it. And uh, then we have number 12, uh, which is sort of your, uh, the attribute info tells you actually something about the attribute layout, how it's stored, whether it's uh, compactly stored or uh, densely stored. And then 12 um, would be an attribute and there are two different attributes, one and attribute two. And so there are just two attribute messages uh, following that. And that would be it. So, so that just gives you a flavor then how you can drill down and, and look at this. So now you could uh, pass out, th this is just the message type, the message size and potential flags, of course, then to get, depending on how the attributes are stored, to get the attribute value, the name and the value, you would have to dive into these messages. But then again, that's what the specification tells you how to do it. And so just, uh, we are out of time uh, or close to out of time. Let me just quickly show you how these pickle files, what these pickle files actually look like. So uh, these are pretty straightforward. So we talked about, I created this HDF5 file that has a super block and a method to obtain the root of this. And I know that the root can be fundamentally um, uh, of two different versions. And uh, you saw there, there was already a union. But um, if we look, for example, at the super block, this is how you would basically 
put the specification and the pickle side by side, or oh, actually I have this on the web page. So what you would actually do is um, put these two things side by side. And uh, when you write down these structural definitions, uh, come on. Um, when you write these structural definitions, you basically read off the specifications what you put here. And I just want to highlight a few things. You can have things, and this is why poke is such a, such a powerful language. You can have, for example, fields in these structures that are conditional on values uh, that you just read. So for example, uh, if, if uh, we, we only find when we read the superblock, we, we discover, well, which version, uh, which superblock version do we read? And depending on that version, we may or may not find certain fields in that structure. So for example, these two fields would be present only in superblock version one. So if we read the superblock version zero, these things would just disappear in poke. And uh, you can also put things there both for readers and writers. So for example, we know that the free space version uh, has to be zero. And uh, if uh, during read, we would find a different version, Poke would actually throw an exception and tell us that there's something fishy going on. Um, sim similar for the, uh, the symbol table version and so forth. And then, um, yeah, you can also indicate this is very important endianness. So the guy who, who created this uh, Poke editor, I mean, he, he knows his business. And uh, yeah, so you, when you, when you uh, are dealing with integers, of course, we are at the byte level here. We have to think about, um, are we dealing with uh, a little engine? And uh, the, uh, I think the specification says in a, in a very obscure place, unless you know where it is, that everything is actually little engine. If you don't know that, you, you can easily get into deep trouble. Um, so this is a very uh, powerful language. And so what you see here, um, well, it looks a little bit like a structure definition, but there is no code here, like C code, seeks or bit flips or uh, none of that. So um, this is really, uh, it's not quite Lisp, but, but it's very high level. It's easy to this code is easy to write and much, much easier to maintain than a big C library. And th this little demo that I just gave you, so for example, passing the object headers here, this is what this looks like. This is not heavy C code or, or very low level code. This is sort of, I would say anything, JavaScript level, Python level uh, code um, to maintain this. And so my uh, hope is that, I mean, I will, uh, the little time that I have, but whenever I ha I, I'm traveling or have a little bit of free time, I will keep adding pickles to this and uh, start developing maybe the first set of small utilities that let you um, interrogate an HDF5 live, uh, level, uh, an HDF5 file. Um, at the level of H5 debug, but then going beyond that, because uh, with this powerful language, uh, going beyond that is is a lot easier than uh, with a with a big uh, C code base. And yeah, so I guess that's as far as we'll get today. Uh, any any questions? Any comments? <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> it's it's yeah. I, I was really surprised when I found this how easy it was. I, again, I I sort of approached this whole thing more with a mindset. Oh yeah, uh, looking at Peter Seibel's book and uh, then starting to write all the code. And that's okay. Uh, that's manageable. And in the case of Lisp, well understood uh, over the decades. But then when I saw this. GNU poke, I thought, wow, uh, it's, and there is a little bit of, uh, there is a just-in-time compiler behind this and so forth. So the, the infrastructure is pretty sophisticated 
And of course, I mean, once we uh, take this to a certain level, if you go there, let's quickly look at the source code here. Um, I forgot the uh, poke, uh, no, no, that's the tarball. Um, let's see, where where is the, oh, here's the Git repository. Uh, they actually have the subdirectory of pickles, which is a great source for inspiration. Uh, to, yeah, here they have these pickles. So you can see here, they have all kinds of things, bitmaps, ASN1s, cough, uh, IEEE. Uh, so th these would be the MP3 specifications. Um, then open PGP, of course, ELF. I think we talked about uh, ELF already. There was ELF. Hmm. Or maybe they factored that out. I don't see it here at the moment. But um, yeah, so once we have something that's reasonably complete, uh, I, I, I'd be happy to contact the author and if they wanted um, uh, add HDF5 to it, we, we could do the, same, do the same thing for HDF4. But uh, that my hope is that could serve then as sort of a reference implementation, if you wish, uh, for how to parse um, HDF5 these, according to these specifications and really add uh, a lot more transparency and tooling around it that that's really maintainable and uh, but yeah that's uh, a few months out if not a few years and okay unless there are any other questions thank you oh, oh Garrett, I, Garrett just uh how long has poke been been out there this is version three but when did when did they start with that <sighs> I don't know. I think it is relatively recent because I think the YouTube video is from last year or the year before. So I'd say 2019, 2020, so three, four years. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm just showing my ignorance here. I, I was not aware of new poke before I, again, I, I stumbled across it when I was looking for uh, how to massage the Font locking in Emacs, and yeah, other people probably felt the shortcomings of Hexel mode, and and somebody said, well, why why bother with Emacs as far as Hexel mode is concerned? Why not use Poke? And then I thought Poke, <laughs> and yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Not. Then thanks for coming and. Uh, come back next week and uh, yeah. And if you're interested in sort of these low level activities, jump in the GitHub repo is out there and I hope I can uh, yeah, make some progress there over the next weeks and months. Okay, thanks, bye. Mm -hmm.